Well, good morning, ladies. It's week two of a five-session series, and last week we studied Eve, and we learned that like Eve, our stories don't end in trial. It doesn't end in our trial. God cares, God restores, and he redeems. Today we're going to study, she's a little spicy, we're going to study Rahab. But before we go into a lot of detail about Rahab, I want to just talk about what she's called She's called Rahab the prostitute. Five times she's mentioned in the Bible, and out of four out of the five times she's called Rahab the prostitute. A title, a label, a degraded one. Um, While this was her occupation, I'm sure she didn't like to be called that. No one likes to be called names. Her lineage is found in uh, in, in Matthew chapter 1, and she's called Rahab in Matthew chapter. The only time out of the five mentions of the Bible is she called Rahab. So when I was in high school, you're going to find this story interesting. This is life in Wales. But when I was in high school, my high school backed up to a gypsy camp. So, yeah. So it was these um, Irish travelers, and they were supposed to travel, but they stayed there. They lived in the gypsy camp. So we would be in mathematics class, and it'd be nothing unusual for a gypsy horse to run across the field while we were having math. So um, one of the students in my high school, his name was Jimmy, and we didn't call him Jimmy. We called him Jimmy the Gypsy. And I've thought so much about Jimmy the Gypsy in light of Rahab the prostitute. I'm sure Jimmy just wanted to be Jimmy. He didn't want to be Jimmy the Gypsy. I'm sure Rahab, if she'd have made different life choices in the beginning, would not have wanted to be Rahab the prostitute. So let's see. Your story is not what you've done or where you are from. It is what Christ is doing in and through you. I want you to think about that because sometimes we drag with us our stories our stories from the past, and we put labels and titles on ourselves that we do not need to do. If you have a personal relationship with Jesus, the Bible says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. We're about to see how God drastically transformed the life of Rahab from living in a house of wars in Jericho to being scorned by other women. Can you imagine you're not going to want your wife or, a, or woman or any other lady or any man to associate with her or know anything about her? So she was lonely. She lived in shame and disgrace. And God literally destroyed all that she knew and gave her a new life. Her story appears on the, cha- on the pages of Joshua chapter 2. We're going to start in Genesis, so don't turn to jo- Joshua quite yet, because I want to kind of give us some history. Um, because God used Joshua, two spies, and Rahab to fulfill the promise to the Israelites that he made in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. And this is called the Abrahamic Covenant. <clears throat> and let's turn to Genesis chapter 12. Verse 1 and 2, and the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. How did the Israelites, after wandering the desert for 40 years, get to the promised land? Let's turn to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua is the sixth book in the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. We're going to set the context for the story of Rahab and how her part, what what her part was in the promised land. Joshua 1, 1 through 4. And after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. That's just a sad line to me. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the river Jordan into the land I'm about to give them to the Israelites. And I will give you every place where you set your foot. As I promised Moses, your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, and to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. All right, did you read what jumped out to you? What jumped out of me is get ready to cross the Jordan. So uh, you got another high school story because high school, you know, there's lots of memories in high school. Some are good and some not so good, but these are good. My favorite teacher of all time was my geography teacher. 
and his name was Mr. Barnfield, and I loved Mr. Barnfield. I loved, that was when we read maps, you know, the big paper maps, no more ways in, uh, we didn't have ways in those days. And um, I loved um, how uh, the contour lines on a map got closer and closer together, and you knew that was a hill. That was stuff I learned in geography. Um, but the best part about Mr. Barnfield's class is if you were um, a student in his class, you went on an outdoor pursuit course. So you had se seven days, and you were out wading in rivers, and you were going um, up hills, and they wanted a pothole. I'm so glad the weather was bad that day. I'm a bit claustrophobic. But we... Um, we had this bright yellow jacket, like waterproof jacket, and these bright yellow pants. We were in high school, because you imagine we're all having a good laugh about this. Um, but we were styling and profiling. But one thing that I learned was I learned that when you're up close and personal with something, when you're hands-on with it, you learn it so much differently. So what I'm going to do is you're going to get a virtual tour of um, a little bit of kind of where we are in history. And you can imagine that you were there. So let's look at Jericho. All right, I was surprised with Jericho when I put... Uh, so we've been to Israel, we've been to Jericho. When I saw Jericho, I was expecting nasty, dusty, kind of, you know, uh, hot. I will say hot was true. It was very, very hot. Um, the Jordan Valley is called... It's in the Jordan Valley, and it's in what they call an oasis in the desert, Summer temperatures are 100 degrees. Um, it is 864 feet below sea level, and it was the first city in Israel to be excavated. An excavator's name, the name um, is um, Dame Kathleen Kenyon, and she's a Brit, and she did a lot in Jerusalem, uh, in Jericho. If you Google her, you will find her um, name, but she was pretty um, instrumental in all that you see in the ruins of Jericho today. It's eight miles north of the Dead Sea. If you can see the Dead Sea, it's 15 miles east of Jerusalem. It's not on my map, but Jerusalem's kind of um, a little bit... I'm trying to see uh, where you are, but it's, it's between... Kind of where AI is. It's in that region, and Bethel is where Jerusalem is today. Tell Jericho is a mountain. So when you go to visit Jericho, you're actually not, you know, standing on Jericho. But what they've happened is 20... Now, they've excavated some of it, but there's 23 layers on the mountain. And each civilization is built on top of another, on top of another, and on top of another. Anytime you go to Israel, often that's the case. Sometimes you see the original uh, ruins. Other times it's tells, and they're digging up ruins from other areas. But it's... Um, it's neat to see and be there. When you stand on Tel Jericho, you can literally see where the Israelites crossed the River Jordan, which is amazing. I remember the first time I went, and they said, that's where the Israelites crossed. I, I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe I was standing there and seeing that. Okay, when you see road signs, Jericho and Jerusalem, you're beside yourself. Like, I'm taking pictures of all these road signs. Um, Jericho dates back to 8,000 BC. It's one of the oldest and lowest cities on the earth. It was a fortress city, city and guarded entrance to Canaan from the east. The record of Jericho's destructions found in Joshua 6. We're not going to talk about that in Joshua 6 because we're going to focus on kind of what Rahab did, but um, you can definitely read for yourself. It had, it had everything except God. It had a water supply, it was fortified, it had a king. Today, it's in the Palestinian territories of the West Bank, just to give you an idea, especially significant today with all that's going on over there. Uh, when you travel to Israel, it's something else to see a place name that you read in the Bible and now you actually see it in person. The emotions you feel are unbelievable. When you read Jerusalem, you think, my word, God's son died in Jerusalem. God's son died in Jerusalem. Geography there, become, it makes the Bible like light up. Because when you're standing on the Mount of Olives and you read, well, he went down to Jerusalem, you're like, wow, there's the Kidron Valley. He did go down to Jerusalem. And when you hear, well, he went up to Jerusalem, well, he was in the Kidron Valley going up to Jerusalem. All of a sudden, your geography matters. So um, I hope you like my little... Um, digression away from it. I wanted you to just get a feel for what Jericho was. Let's go back to Joshua chapter 1 and verse 12, and this is where 
um, God does some amazing things with the Israelites. But to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half and the half tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, Remember the command that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you, and he said, The Lord your God will give you rest by giving you this land. Your wives and your children and your livestock may stay in the land that Moses gave you east of the Jordan, but all your fighting men ready for battle must cross over ahead of your fellow Israelites. You are to help them until the Lord gives them rest as he has done for you and until they too have taken possession of the land and the Lord your God has given them. After that, you may go back and occupy your own land, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you east of the Jordan towards the sunrise. What does all that mean? There was unity among Joshua's people. God repeats, and you know when you've read Joshua 1, be strong and courageous. He says that three times to him because Joshua led with God on his side. He had God's words in his heart. The next slide I want to show you is the tribes. I want you just to get a feel for, if you can see, half of Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben, you know, are on the other side. Well, if you look at the map, you can see that Jericho is on the east so Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh had to go over, help them occupy and conquer Jericho, and then go back. And this is where all the tribes were located after they conquered Jericho. But first they had to conquer Jericho. We're going to learn that through Rahab's testimony of God's power, God protected her, he provided for her, and he had a plan for her. God's promise was the promised land. He wanted to get the people away from the harlotry of the Moabite women who the Israelites were entertaining after the success of conquering the Amorite kings, Sion and Og. And ironically, he uses a harlot to do this. Now, Joshua's really smart, and we're going to find out why. Because I'm sure you know, back in Moses' days, Remember, they sent the spies to check out the land. Twelve spies went. Well, two of them were Joshua and Caleb. And Joshua and Caleb said, hey, it looks great. I think we can, I think we can take them. I don't think he said that, but I think he did. Um, everything looks great. And then when they came back and reported to Moses, all of them came together. Um, and it was this big assembly. And Moses didn't make the move. So Joshua's like, I'm not going to forget what's happened here, and I'm not going to make the same mistake again. So this is what he did. I think I'm a bit ahead of myself. But Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went, and they entered the house of the prostitute named Rahab, and they stayed there. Remember, the promised land was a land flowing with milk and honey, so it was perfect for them to conquer it. Um, the 12 spies would have been in 1445 BC. They were located in Kadesh, Barnea, and they literally kind of went all the way up the promised land looking. Joshua was not going to make the same mistake that they had done earlier. He and Caleb were part of that early expedition or scope out or whatever you want to call it. And he said he's not going to do that. It cost him 40 years in the wilderness. So he just sent two. And his instruction to the two spies were, you come back to me and you tell me what you see. So to clarify, let's talk about them going to Rahab's house. They stayed at Rahab's house purely to spy. They left Shittim early in the morning to walk two hours. Seven, there was seven miles to wait. Ac- that was seven miles. And they waded across the wood, r- River Jordan. So I'm thinking they're hot and sweaty. They're wet. Then they had, it's waist high, the River Jordan. I've been baptized in there, so it's not like super deep, but it can be pretty rough going in flood level. Um, Then they made another seven hours trek. So they've got seven hours to the Jordan, seven miles, I'm sorry, seven miles to the Jordan River, way through the Jordan River, and then another seven miles. So they got to Jericho just before the gates closed at night. Rahab's house was a perfect location to hide spies. Perfect. One, she was accustomed to having foreign guests, unfortunately. I know. (laughs) It would have been in a seedy part of town, so not so super obvious. 
Her house was in part of the city wall and they could see the whole city, so it was a great lookout. They could scope it out easily. And they knew she'd welcome them because she was confidential about who came and went in her home. The spies treated Rahab with respect and she saw that they were different. She says, in, she says she knew that they followed Yahweh. Joshua 2, 9, I know that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. Everyone in Jericho could have known that the Israelites were camped on the other side. They did know. They knew, the, they could see them. There's rumor going around. You see, there's a lot of Israelites and they were kind of camped out out there. I wonder what's going on. But life went on. Life went on in the city of Jericho. People were coming and going. The doors were open. The doors were closed. They didn't know what was coming. They were comfortable in their fortified city with lovely, fresh, running water. We're going to talk about Rahab and how God protected her. The king of, we're in Joshua 2, 2 through 7. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two spies and hidden them. And she said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they came from. And at dusk, when it was time to close the city gates, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them to the roof, hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone, the gate was shut. So the king of Jericho was spying on her, obviously. Somebody told them that they had arrived, and he sends officers. Let's just get into the facts about her, um, just some information we know. She was a prostitute, and she ran a brothel from her house. She was a Canaanite. I thought this was kind of odd. I still think it's odd that she lived with her parents, brothers, and sisters when she ran that kind of business. I just, I don't know. It's kind of odd. She was single. She was used to keeping secrets of the clientele who visited her, and she was not afraid to house Israel's spies. She had what God needed, necessary, necessary supplies. She had flax, she had rope, and she had a scarlet robe that he used, rope, uh, a scarlet core, cord that he used. She had flax, she had rope, and a scarlet cord. She had tremendous faith in God that the spies would save her and her whole family. Has anybody seen the musical, The Sound of Music? It's my favorite. Somebody asked me the other day, what's your favorite movie? I said, The Sound of Music. I know it's not a movie, but that's my favorite. So I was thinking about, you remember the scene where the Von Trapp family have sung their song and then they get in the, they run to the abbey, you know, and they're running through the abbey and, um, and then the, they're being pursued by the army and they're right at the gate. Do you remember that scene? And then at the gate, the nuns are walking towards to open the door and one of the nuns says to the other nun, slowly, do you remember that scene slowly? Well, that nun happens to be Portia Nelson, the walk down the street poet lady I read to you last week in Eve. Anyway, I'm thinking this is how Rahab went to the door to open it to the king's messengers. Slowly she went, <laughs> giving the spies a chance to hide under the flax on the roof. But God protected. He protected the spies by hiding them from the guards. He protected the spies by having the guards believe Rahab. He protected Rahab by the guards not finding the spies. He protected Rahab by having the spies search outside of Jericho. And he protected her by saving her whole family. What? All right, here we go into something. Was Rahab's lie to the king's messenger justified? I had this massive discussion with my husband about this whole lying topic. Um, growing up and working in a corrupt society, lying was a way of life for Rahab. She did it all the time. She did. That was what she did. She lied. And she knew about God, but she didn't know him. She didn't know him. Every human being is under God's authority, even those who don't know or believe in God. 
Let's think about that. Let that process. Every human being is under God's authority, even those who don't know or believe in God. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord at the end of times. So before we get too off track, just to find her lie, which we might could do, I want to just talk about a couple of things about lying. Scripture never condemns the lie. God cannot lie, it says, Numbers 23, 19. God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? God uses evil for good. We know that. His ways are higher than ours. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. Rahab is not applauded for her ethics. Joshua 2, 1 is the house of a prostitute. Rahab is a positive example of faith. Hebrews eleven thirty one. She's in the hall of faith, and um, that's why she's there. God provides power through his provision for her. So we're going to turn, if you're following me with your Bible, we're going to go to Joshua chapter 2, staying in Joshua chapter 2, verse 8 through 9. Before the, lay, before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sion and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, who you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you, For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Getting back to the uh, flies, getting back to the spies on the roof. Um, I'm going to click on the next verse, which we just read. Flax on the roof for the spies were available for her to hide, for them to hide under. Flax was used to make linen and priestly garments, to make linen for priestly garments. Ordinary garments, sails, nets, twines, and things to, uh, to wrap the dead. He also provided a way of escape for the spies, Rahab, and her family. He provided a reason to completely change the trajectory of Rahab's life forever with forgiveness and restoration. Let's finish and read what Rahab says to the spies. Joshua chapter 2, verse 12 through 22. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and my mother, my brothers and my sisters and all who belong to them and you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she, so she let them down by the rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall, and she said to them, go to the hills, so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourself for three days until they return, and then go on your way. Now the men had said to her, this oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless, when we enter the land, you have tied the scarlet cord in your window." Through which you let us down, and unless you have brought your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your family into your house, if any of them go outside your house into the streets, their blood will be on their own heads. We will not be responsible. As for those who are in the house with you, their blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on them. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from the oath you made a swear. Agreed, she replied. Let us be as you say. So she sent them away and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. And when they left, they went into the hills and stayed there three days until the pursuers had searched all along the road and returned without finding them. There's four kinds of parts to what I just read. The negotiation, the condition, the binding of the oath and the condition. The negotiation, this is what Rahab says to the spies. Kindness for kindness. Kindness for the kindness I have shown you. 
a sign that you will spare the lives of my father and my mother and my brothers and sisters, our lives for your lives. The condition, what the spy said to Rahab, if you do not tell, we will, if you, if you tell, we will not treat you kindly or faithfully. The binding of the oath was between the spies and Rahab. Tie a scarlet cord, which he did right away, and all your family need to be in the house and they will be spared. And then the condition, the spies to Rahab. If you tell what we are doing, we will be released from this oath you made us swear. Let's go to our next slide. God's power through his plan. Then the two men started back. They went down out of the hills, forded the river, and came to Joshua, son of Nun, and told him everything that had happened to them. And they said to Joshua, the, sh the Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. Notice Joshua didn't send the spies all up in the country like the other spies went. The other spies kind of went like they had a, they had a trip, like a vacation. They were going all through that. Joshua just sent them to Jericho. Can we conquer Jericho? Jericho's our first spot. If we can do that, we're into the promised land. Next that happens, as you know, in Joshua 4, the ark is carried across the River Jordan. God parts the River Jordan. And remember, there are 12 stones in the middle, one for each tribe, and it's carried to the place where they stop, which is in Gilgal. Let's continue through his plan. Joshua chapter 6, verse 22 through 23. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the prostitute's house and bring her out in accordance with your oath to her. So the young men who had done the spy and went in, brought out Rahab and her father and her mother, her brothers and her sisters, and all who belonged to her. They brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. God's plan for Rahab didn't end with her coming out of Jericho. God totally changed her life. She went, she went from worshiping idols to worshiping the one true God. I love me some C.S. Lewis. Um, and this is just an amazing quote that I think is just such a good one from him. But the great thing to remember is that though our feelings come and go, his love for us does not. It's not wearied by our sins or our indifference, and therefore it is quite relentless in its determination that we shall be cured of those sins at whatever cost to us, at whatever cost to him. And so he was relentlessly pursuing Rahab. And um, this is what happens to her life. I love a good, a good nursery rhyme, maybe not nursery rhyme, a good kind of Cinderella story. I feel like Rahab's is a bit of a Cinderella story, and I, I love that, how God can take a human being so sinful and with a life just so shameful, and he can turn her around for his glory and for his honor, and that's what he did with her life because Rahab appears in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, the lineage of Christ, and Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, not Rahab the prostitute, just Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. She went from selling her body in prostitution to being married to Salmon and having children who were listed in the lineage of Christ. There's hope. There's hope for everybody. God gives everybody hope. His son was Boaz. We've, we've studied Boaz. He was the Kingsman Redeemer. Interesting about Boaz is in the book of Ruth was that Ruth was a Moabitess, so she would be a non-believer, marries an Israelite, and becomes a believer. And the same thing happens with Rahab. Um, so that was kind of good. I feel like Ruth was the daughter-in-law of Rahab. So can't you imagine that Ruth, Ruth and Rahab had some things to talk about? some things they had grown up with in life and how very different God had um, made their lives. Rahab escaped from a pagan life to the life of an Israelite. 
Rahab would have known what it was like to go from a pagan life to the life of a believer in God. A new life for Rahab and her whole family. Now her name is simply Rahab, just Rahab. She appears in the lineage of Christ, like I said just a few minutes ago, and I can't say that enough because God just redeems and restores and over and over again, and we do not deserve him. We don't. And yet he loves us so much that he does great things for us. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient in Hebrews eleven thirty one, God changed the trajectory of Rahab's life through his protection, through his provision, and through his plan. And God can do that for you. Do you have a label, a name that you or someone else has given you that may be stopping you from fully living the life God has called you to live? Believe today that you're a new creation in Christ. If you know Christ, drop the label. Drop it. That is not who God intended for you to be. The past does not have a hold over you. God has amazing things planned for your future. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the example you give us in the Bible of the life of Rahab. And Father, I don't know who in this room needs to know how very much you love them and how very much you've forgiven their past. Lord, you forgave Rahab's past and set her on a new trajectory. She would never be the same. You redeemed her and you restored her and you loved her. You protected her and you provided for her and you had a plan for her and help us all to know that's what you do for us over and over again, that there is no sin that we've committed that can't be forgiven by you. So Lord, I pray for each lady that they'll walk out today. The burden they've carried of who they may have been in the past will be released, Lord, and they will be new in you because they know you and you live in them. So I just ask, Lord, as our discussion uh, time together will honor and give you glory. I just thank you for being here this morning with us. It's in your name we pray.